Hey guys, welcome back to the Last Set Podcast and today I have a very special guest. The first time we spoke was over Zoom where he reached out and I was more than happy to have him on. I walked away from that conversation feeling as if I thoroughly enjoyed it so much I had to bring him back for a round two, which was again another incredible conversation. Now, he's been around the world, he's a professional combat sports nutritionist, he's worked, like some, worked alongside some of the best athletes in the game and once again back in the studio for another round. Please welcome my brother from a scouse mother, <laughs> Peter Miller. What's good, man? How's it going, mate? It's good. Happy to be back for the third time. Is that, is that a record or is it? Yeah. It is. You and one other guy, Jamil, who's a good buddy of mine, are the only people to become on three times. It's a pleasure. Yeah. um, I mean, it's just, it feels nice because I've done this for over two years now and it's like clockwork and to just have people on and actually want to come on and all that, it's the best thing rather than just having to constantly like reach out. Yeah. And it's also good to see the impact. And you, sir, it's good to see the impact of your work. I mean, you just got back from, what, a four-month tour? Yeah, and it, it, it's probably a little bit long when it worked out in my head. It's probably about, yeah, four and a half, five months. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, was, it, was, it was funny because we didn't, we spoke at the beginning of the year when you got invited to Russia. Yeah. And then, that, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that sort of, um, didn't go to, <laughs> go to <laughs> I thought that was funny because... Like you, sh- you put up the thing on your Instagram. You had the sign, you had the seal, you had the emblem, had the, you know, the signature. It was like legit as fuck. And then I was like, man, this is so fucking cool. Get to go to Russia and all that. But this was pre-Ukraine. Yeah. And then it fell through, and it didn't fall through in the end. Yeah, it, it was strange because I, I worked with a couple of guys in Russia, and he was going, oh, we'll we'll get you over. And at the time, I thought, oh, he's 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 just saying it, being polite. And then he started asking, like, you know can you come this date? And I was like, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking that nothing was going to happen. Yeah. A couple of weeks later, I get an email from the Russian government. Really? The sign, that signed letter saying, yeah, you're invited over for a year to work with the Russian Boxing Federation. Um, and I was like, yeah, he was actually telling the truth. <laughs> it, was pretty, it was pretty crazy. So what was it in the end? Was it like some visa complications? Or? Yeah, I think it's just, it, just the, the war in Ukraine sort yeah. of point. I, think I, I didn't really... Um, <laughs> sort of follow it up and then the guy who I was working with over there he I don't know what I actually haven't spoken to him for a while I think he moved away and then I just I just thought there's no point in me following up especially what's going on there's um yeah sort of bigger yeah. issues sort of because well, if you're lucky I mean as gut of course this was pre-Ukraine so I was a bit gutted that obviously you didn't get to go but then with everything else that's happened lately yeah it was kind of a blessing in disguise yeah because I could imagine like potentially be stuck over like anything could have happened over there that's, that's, that's <laughs> what I think about it now like yeah um, it would have been cool to go but you know maybe potentially in the future ah, yeah. but yeah. it was it was it was, a, it, was a, it was a it was a crazy um, it was a crazy experience getting yeah the Russian Russian government yeah. sends you a letter to invite you over well it goes to show like when you, uh, we've said this on the last podcast, but like when you're being authentic and when you do your job well and you actually dedicate yourself to the craft, like you yeah. knows where it can can get to you and to like get to travel yeah. and all that. I mean, you just went to Singapore a couple yeah. of weeks. Was it not that long ago to watch uh, to, for Jack Della? Yeah. And sorry, I forgot the, who was the other gentleman. Sean Etchell. Yeah. How did he end up going on this? So he lost. So he was on the road to UFC tournament. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um so yeah, he was. So the the road to the UFC tournament was on the Wednesday and the Thursday, and then the UFC at the main UFC event was on the Sunday. So it was a pretty um mm. pretty hectic week. Yeah, and that was your first time at a UFC like yeah, being first, there in that room at the UFC like, event. It was so cool, like watching your story, being yeah. that close to the scales, being that close to all the yeah, figures. Yeah, it, you know? it was pretty. It was pretty surreal. Um, and such a um a blessing in a way, knowing that like being in this event and and you. There's also there's always so much to learn as well, and um, like the ins and outs of it, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, it was pretty awesome. That's cool. That's cool. And like for for Jack personally, what was like the was there much of a wake up for him, or was no, it any J- Jack, all things just smooth? Jack's pretty much on top of his, his nutrition all year round. So with my job, is just a little tweak here and there, helping with the weight cut, and yeah, he was good to go. Pretty pretty cruisy, really. Mm-hmm. Um. And especially like in the in the UFC when staying in the hotel, it's like a 
five star hotel. There's like hundreds of UFC UFC, UFC staff there, so like anything you need, they can sort it out. Um, so yeah, it was a, it was it was a bit different compared to doing it in um, somebody's house or in in a gym. It was a yeah, it was it was, was eye opening experience. Cool, cool. And the other thing I wanted to ask you, so because now that you've experienced it all, yeah. like uh, with the whole, and we've talked heaps and heaps about weight cutting, this is old news now. But yeah. I wanted to also hear it from your perspective. Yeah. Not that too long ago, we had the UFC card where we had the weight cut miss with Charles Oliveira, yeah. and there was a lot of controversy around the whole situation with the scales. Yeah. And then they were talking about the calibration with the scales, yeah. like they switch it over. Yeah. And for someone who's actually been there. Do, can you actually like vouch for it? Is that correct? Like something um, like that where things you like that can happen. Um you know, for example, with Jack, the day of the wake up, I bought a set of, you know, scales from Harvey Norman. Mm-hmm. We we went to the UFC scales, compared it, wrote the difference between say it was a hundred grams off on our scales. So we it, it's important to, to get that um to get that done. But I can I can understand like things like that. Like that's what I've learned in that in in that experience where you could have everything dialed in and think everything's perfect and then something something could go wrong. So I can I, I can understand why it, like that could happen. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I'll give you an example. So it was Sean's weight cut. Doing the bath, the bath was the bath temperature temperature was way too hot. But then doing. Jack's um, wake up. The bath temperature was way too cold. Yeah. So like you, you just little things that you 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 think you've got dialed in, and you, you, like little things can you know slip up and you delayed a little bit. It's just yeah, sort of um, yeah. You can't predict what 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 will happen, even if you've got F and hundred percent dialed in. Hundred percent. Yeah, that's that's correct because. Now weight cutting is becoming more and more a topic of debate about the whole yeah. situation and. You know, guys using like extreme methods and all that, and it's now gotten to a point where there's more and more research into it. Yeah, and it's getting to a point now where fighters are starting to slowly become more educated yeah. on why it's better to do a long term cut rather than just a quick water cut and all that, rather than in the bath or in a sauna. And we talked about that and yeah. how it's more beneficial to go into a bath and all. Yeah, in your like times, like. When you were traveling and all that, like, what were some of the big things like you picked up on when it came to like? Was there anything that you learned over in your four months, like from you can share with uh, us in terms of weight cutting? In terms of weight cutting, um, what I learned, especially when I gave, for example, online, I give someone like a post weigh and rehydration food strategy, and then when you're there in person, it never goes, it's never like to the absolute dot. And I realised that in, in my practice, that there has to be a little bit more potential flexibility where some guys will be like, well, I've, I've, I haven't eaten my favourite Nando's meal for eight weeks. I really want that. And then it's a little bit, being a little bit more flexible with um, sort of my practice. In terms of weight cutting, everything really went pretty, I'm trying to think anything. Yeah, it's just been a bit more just, just the, sort of sidetracked a bit. That's one of the main reasons why I I went away because I got to a point over here where I was doing well, working online, guys across the world. And I was yeah. like, I really want to be at these. Yeah, events. I really want to support the, the fighters at the events because you there's, there's so much more to learn when you're there compared to being online. And I wanted to improve my practice. At the same time, it'd be quite comfortable being in Perth and just, you know, tick along doing doing the, the fight camp plans. But being there in Perth and networking, um, that's one thing I've, re- I've learned, that there's, there's so much of a personal side to learn from in, in them events, if that makes sense. Yeah. It must have been, like, super, super nice to travel and all that. Yeah, it was, it, it was cool because I, I, I'm, I'm sort of mad into, like, me self development and stuff like that, yeah. and I, 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 I was weighing up the options about going. I was like, well, what's the downside in going? You know, traveling for a bit. You know, I'm, a, I'm a single man, got no, no ties over here, kind of thing. <laughs> so I was like, you know what? Well, I was like, well, I could go. I can always come back to Perth in a couple of months if it doesn't sort of work out the way it did, um, way I wanted it to. 
And I went, and it's probably been the best thing from my business point of view, being there at the events, networking with people, and the certain fighters that I've got in my books now that I wouldn't would never have got if I wouldn't have met them in person. That is correct. I mean, you had... Ah, uh, damn, I didn't quite put that in there. But you had Cage Warriors... Yep. You had WBC champion, yep. and then you had, didn't you have one who was kickboxing champion and all that? Kickboxer, um, it's got Nathan Jordan, um, probably the most recent guys, Liam Harrison. That's yeah. it, that's yeah. the one yeah, yeah. I was thinking of, yeah. yeah. And, like, to come back after that, like, you've been a nutritionist for how long now? I got my degree in 2016. 2016, so... Six years. Mm. So that's a that's that's exactly the way it should be now. Yeah. Yeah, that's as it goes to show over time when you do the work. Oh yeah, it pays off. Yeah, because yeah. what we spoke about last time was like you, you, you. A lot of people. It's not criticizing people, but people quit after six months. Go, it's not working. I've tried. I, I know people from who have started personal training business, mm -hmm. and you know they don't see the results for a while. And like, oh, it's not going to work. And it just it just takes a lot more time than that. And if you really love something and you want to be good at it, 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 it takes that period. To like it, sometimes it can take a couple of years. It took me years to do, mm -hmm. but then once you once you get over, I think what we spoke about last time, that threshold where you're pushing, 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 mm -hmm. and then you get a couple of clients. They recommend you to someone else, and then it just it's a lot. E it makes it a lot easier in the end. Like especially in terms of you know I I like I've got. Um, I've done good work with clients, and now clients are just people messaging me from across the world. And that's yeah. you think about it a couple of years ago. I thought I'd never, I'd never believe that would that would have happened, but now it's happened. It's it's, it's but that's just through putting that effort in over time. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. How many fighters have you got under your roster right now, or how many athletes? Um, have you got on your roster? about forty odd. I don't know. Forty odd. Yeah. Jesus. Um, how did you manage all that while you were traveling? That's the big thing. Well, we'll go. We'll we'll talk about it a little bit more in depth. But um, yeah, I um, one of the reasons why I came came back to well, traveling to be at these events, and what an, an idea that came to my head when I was over here is, is like fight camp seminars. So I thought to my head, like, what? How could I educate people on like a bigger bigger level? So I came up with this fight camp fight camp seminar, designed it, PowerPoint presentation, and. Um, I thought I'll try I'll try out in the gym like so I message one um Nathan Bender who's one of my clients I'm quite close to him because I worked with him for a while so I was like you know can I try out this seminar in your gym and see you know what the feedback is see you know, some people might not get a good response and might might get a good response so but I'll try it out and then I did it and people were really interested in it I thought well this could potentially go somewhere now and it's gone from that and when I go back in the UK I've got like 15, 20 seminars lined up already. It's like a crazy, wow. yeah, and and that's sort of a, a good from a from a a personal point of view. Like public speaking is never like never one of the things that I'm very comfortable with. But um, doing that and talking about something and seeing like the impact that has on on educating people because it's crazy. You go to certain gyms and people have like no idea how how to cut weight properly and mm. i think you forget sometimes like how much you actually know in comparison to someone who hasn't researched or studied it that makes sense mm -hmm. but that's that's one of the main reasons why um i came back was to do that as well um but in terms of managing clients it's yeah uh, it, it actually works out okay sometimes because the australian time zone because majority of my clients in australia or the uk it's probably a 65 35 split um english to aussie so it, it 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 works out actually all right instead of having them all in the same time zone it'd probably be a little bit more difficult that yeah sense. yeah and as well it's crazy how you handle all that by yourself as well yeah you know? and I remember you telling me like it's pretty much a full time 12 hour gig you yeah. know on the laptop on the phone but i suppose that's the luxury like i i i've got i've got the best job i like i love what i do and like mm. being able to to travel that that's a that's a benefit to the job and you know the way I look at things if it's important you can get it done 100 percent. and in that time while you were traveling i was yeah. always keeping up to date about the stuff that you were posting yep 
And one of the best ones I actually saw was the one you posted about uh, fighters and why they shouldn't be having a high fat meal yep. after a weight cut. Yep. And that was r- like really, really insightful and all that. Now, is this something that's new that's come around, or is this um, just something that you found out recently? It's Sorry, it's it's it's, it's, it's in it's in the research, um, just in terms of, like general digestion research. Um, if you want me to go into it a little bit, yeah, go um, ahead. Mate, by all means. So basically, the, you, you really want to avoid anything high fat post weigh because fat slows down digestion. So basically. Carbohydrate digestion begins in the mouth, so there's enzymes in the mouth that break. So basically, class it as scissors, cutting down them carbohydrates as soon as you've you've um, you've got it in your mouth. And then with protein digestion, it starts in the stomach. Fat digestion doesn't typically start until the small intestine. So if you look at the GI tract, there's the mouth, the esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine. Mm-hmm. So fat digestion doesn't actually start mainly until the small intestine. So think about that process. So it takes a longer time to digest. So a big a big thing with fighters, they'll they'll weigh in, right, boom, let's go and get a big pizza and cookies and shit. And that's that high fat meal will uh, displace other nutrients which are needed post weighing, like for example carbohydrates. Mm-hmm. So it's um it's an area which people tend to forget about. Obviously like with food you're never gonna get it like you're never going to say, right, you can cut fat out completely, no. but you've still got to be weird. Like, rule of thumb is, like, you want to try and have, like, 0.5 grams per kilogram body mass. So, say, you ate at 70, around 35 grams around that period. You don't want to be going overboard. But, um, yeah, surprisingly, like, not many... I'd say not many people know it because it's understandable, but, yeah, it's an area which doesn't really get spoken about. Fair point. Fair point. Uh, so ideally, like coming off the scales, yeah. What uh, do you have? Like a complete process that the have the fighter has to go through straight away off the scales. Like, okay, he's off. Get some water in him. Yeah. Get some fluids in him. Especially if it's if they've caught a, a significant amount of weight. So our class a significant amount of weight is probably three percent of the body weight over. So the main focus as soon as they weigh in, is, is fluid over food. So you want to be getting that fluid back in. So ideally, the first hour, you just want to be getting the your fluid with electrolytes or rehydration solutions in and then slowly start introducing carbohydrates. Um, so say, for example, weigh in, fluid for the first hour, and then hour later, maybe something light like, you know, a bagel or, you know, some jellies, it, slowly introducing more fluid as well like sports drinks and then a few hours later this is this is also this is also dependent on the time of the weighing as well so if it's like a morning midday weighing um so three four hours later that's when you really want to start introducing more you know heavier carbohydrates like your pastas rice noodle type dishes um but like a big thing a lot of people just like the weigh in boom straight to straight to nando's those but they still got to get that fluid mm-hmm back in um but yeah there's like mainly like yeah like three three sorts of processes you want to go to like the fluid number one and then the second phase is just slowly introducing carbohydrates and then the third th- phase sorry um have more solid bigger meals yeah understood now this is something actually i had a friend who had requested this for, uh question for you yeah uh we've talked a lot about you know nutrition getting off the scales nutrition on the day and then there was like nutrition also leading up to the fight as well. Yeah. And my friend literally asked me, actually a question I thought was a bit bizarre when I heard it, but in a way I thought to myself, yeah, that doesn't make too much sense. So that makes a fair, fair bit of sense. But do you ever have any kind of supplementation that you would give literally almost before they walk out? Like I've been hearing stories about fighters taking pre-workout or dry, almost dry scooping a couple of sc- scoops of pre-workout uh, before they go out into a fight or to get themselves psyched up or some beta alanine. So the way I look at it, if you haven't tried it during camp, I wouldn't try it on the day. So if you've never, if you you don't usually have caffeine before a fight and then you have like you think, oh, I'm gonna have caffeine, I wouldn't really recommend that because you know you've never done it before, so it could lead into you know could have. GI distress or anything could happen. So I'd, I'd, my rule of thumb is don't 
do anything that you typically don't do mm. on fight day. And this is the thing where going into when I'm giving post weigh nutrition strategies and fight day, a lot of the time I say, look, like I leave I leave it down to yourself on fight day. Mm-hmm. I know I could give you the textbook recommendations, what you should have X amount of hours before, the, the exact gram of carbohydrates, but a lot of the time it's what you're comfortable with. So I try and go like, rule of thumb, try and get a good breakfast, good lunch down, yeah. Some snacks throughout the day, but some guys don't want to, don't want to eat. Like, like, mm. not, well, not not very close. Like, some yeah. guys will have a breakfast. And like, I don't want to eat anymore. Like, so you've got to take into account the the personal side of it as well. Instead of being like the the sports nutritionist, like this is what the textbook says. Like, you've got to have thirty grams of carbs an hour. But do you know what I mean? So, um, yeah. In terms of supplements, if you haven't tried it, in, if you haven't tried Jordan Camp or in previous fights, I wouldn't recommend it. Fair point, fair point. Now, because I just thought when I heard that, it was absolutely bizarre because you nowadays, we're in was it in training and also just in gym culture in general, supplementation is becoming more and more prevalent. Yeah. You know, because there's more and more research coming out. Um, the new thing that a lot of guys my age on the market are taking these days is testosterone, which is something I also wanted to ask you. I don't remember if you ever posted about it. No, I to be honest, with you, I haven't dived that into it. Yeah, um, to give like a, a probably a detailed, informed opinion on it. Mm-hmm. Um, surprisingly, a lot of my guys haven't like no one's really yeah. mentioned it to me. So it's one of the things where like I haven't looked into it as much as probably should. It's not as much in the f- and uh, in obviously fight uh, yeah. in combat sports, yeah. but it's becoming more and more prevalent just lately in gym culture, mainly yeah. just gym bros or yeah. gym girls and all of that who are getting involved in. They've been talking a lot about it. There was a big hype train because I believe it was Andrew Human. Oh, okay, he was the one who sort of first introduced, not introduced, but he was the one who really like spoke about it. And yeah. if you go on Rogan, pretty much, yeah, that's a big thing. Or <laughs> so he was talking about it on Rogan and the oh. benefits of it. Uh, and also things like sleep supplements yeah. and all that. And obviously sleep is vital. Uh, so what that was the other thing I was going to lead to was like in terms of supplementation, like has there been any new research recently into anything that was going to be helping you sleep? Because nowadays pretty much the only thing I hear is like almost every fighter under the sun is sponsored by a CBD company and all that. Yeah, with the CBD research... Um this may be going a little bit off the topic, but yeah. there's been um, there was a study. I think I did a post about it where, you know, because CBD, CBD is everywhere, gummies, gels, yeah. lollipops, and they did a study where they examined the ingredients of 20 different brands. I think this is in America mm-hmm. to see the actual CBD oil content, and like only like 10% actually had the. The, the amount that they said on the tin, basically. Ah. Um, it's a bit of a strange one with CBD because, especially at, a, at an elite level, you really want to be on top of what, what brand. Are you taking a reputable brand? Because, say, you take it, there's been times where they've had contaminated substances in. I think there was a... I don't know if it was an American swimmer or gym mask where she was taking CBD and it, it contained other things. And she, she got an anti... Um, open violation so oh. um it's it's one of them areas where anyone at that that sort of elite level you know, when you're getting when you are getting drug tested you've got to be very careful that kind of stuff and in terms of sleep there's actually been stuff where cbd oil can actually negatively affect really? sleep yeah How um, so? i don't know the exact mechanisms but there's been studies where it's just it's just disrupted sleep the sleep pattern like the or the onset of you know going to sleep um, in terms of supplements for sleep, it's mainly melatonin that mm. there's been the research on. Um, it's actually an area that I've started to look into a bit more um, because of traveling. Mm-hmm. Um, you know the, the the effects of jet lag and travel fatigue and how to manage that in a sort of simpler way instead of giving supplements out. Like simple things like having there's been studies showing having a high um, GI carbohydrate meal before bed can actually promote sleep. Having protein before bed can promote sleep. Uh, try to avoid fat, um, because that can negatively affect sleep. So it's a, it's an interesting area. Which there's no sort of definitive, like this is what you should have kind of thing. Mm-hmm. 
That's a fair, that's actually, you, you skipped ahead of what I was going to ask next. Because yeah. in terms of like traveling yeah. and just things like evolving the circadian river yeah. and how, you know, jet lag and all that fucks up sleep. Yeah. I'm guessing you wouldn't have to worry too much because when you went to Singapore, Singapore was in the same time zone. Yeah, as same us, time zone, yeah. So you wouldn't have had to worry. No, no. But did you ever have any fighters when you traveled over to the UK and when you traveled uh, with ever, uh, when you travel with other fighters or they've had to do long distances? Is there like a set process you would have for uh, that would depend on the amount of hours of flight? So the number of hours of the flight, let's say, for example. If you got a fighter who's got to travel from Perth all the way to England, yeah, or that, like, would you advise them to travel at a certain time period or a certain weeks building up to it, or what would you do? Well, ideally, see, I've never actually had the situation where, like, when I visited guys when I've been traveling, it's been based in the UK. But in terms of the travel, you want to get there as 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 early as possible mm-hmm. to affect the, because um, if you're traveling across, because jet lag's typically traveling across three time zones or more mm-hmm. it tends to be worse if you're traveling easterly compared mm-hmm. to westerly uh, why is that uh, um i think it's something to do with the just the time that you you you're awake in the basically because you're ahead mm-hmm. is that the, the time difference ahead it can affect like sort of you, you typically tend to wake up later mm-hmm. um, when you're traveling easily compared to earlier in Wesley. Um, even example this weekend, I've got a girl fighting a Muay Thai Grand Prix and she's fighting a girl who's just come from the UK and she only flew out on Tuesday. And like in my sports nutrition head, I'm thinking, so that's eight time zones. Like usually it takes a day to recover from each time zone. It's like that's like very close to it. Like competing on a Saturday and you're only flying on the Tuesday. It's like, oh, that's like very close like ideally you want to be you want to be flying out like at least 10 10 days two weeks before to minimize that effect it's basically like a day easterly it's like a day for every hour every time zone you cross for to, to align with the sleep pattern a normal sleep pattern that makes sense that's a very good rule of thumb yeah, yeah. That. like yeah. uh so but like they, also like with that it's like an area where there's conflicting research on 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 like there's no definitive this is what you should do kind oh, of thing so it's not concrete right yeah now. um in terms of like just basic like nutrition habits like i mentioned like you've probably seen posts of them where you know when you get to the the hotel wherever you stay and make sure it's a good sleeping environment so you you utilize eye mass noise cancelling headphones so you, you get a really good sleep routine make sure the the temperature's right in the room mm-hmm. try and have naps um just really simple things like that and then like the nutrition side of things i mentioned about you know having some you know even something simple as like ha- having a bowl of cocoa pops before you go to sleep that can help like high gi foods mm-hmm. can help promote sleep but um it's very individualized so it, s- some of these things may work for some may not work for others because some people are you know um you know morning people some people are like um evening you know night owls and um, so yeah it's very very individualized mm-hmm. fair point so while you're also traveling as well yeah uh in e- when you were back in england or yeah. that obviously you had to fly say eight, eight time zones and all yeah. that but just to be back in the uk and all that what was it actually like for you because originally you've been in australia for how long now five years in september uh, five years yeah oh, okay was it your first time back second time back second so time. the time before that was august 2019 mm-hmm. so um yeah it was it was it was strange like like for anyone who's ever lived away from some from your home when you come back like you're only there for a few days it feels like you haven't actually been away it's very very surreal <laughs> yeah you have home for the week I'm like oh like i live in liverpool again it's like uh but it was it was quite funny because when I flew home the first time, I had a guy who was defending his Cage Warriors world title, and so he was fighting on the Friday. I was waiting for my exam in between visas in Australia at the moment, so I was waiting for the travel. It's a bridge and visa B basically, so it means you can travel while your visa's processing. So I applied for it, and it it, it was taking ages to come through. And it usually takes a couple of days. I'm like going on here mm-hmm. and it got to the tuesday I'm like it's, it's going to be pushing it getting yeah. to this event for, especially in london because i'm flying to manchester 
and it came through on the Wednesday morning. So I flew on the Wednesday night. Oh. Got to Manchester um, Thursday afternoon. Then Manchester Liverpool was about 45 minutes. Went to Liverpool and then that following evening I got the train down to London. Wow. And then did the Cage Warriors on the Friday oh, night. Oh my God. And like, I'm not going to lie to you. I was, I was sitting there thinking, I am absolutely knackered. <laughs> 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 I, was like, I was like, I might have to get like, I feel really bad, but I need to get like a drink down me. So I just I went to the bar and started just down a couple of vodkas I needed to. I was like, I was so tired. <laughs> but like I did it on the slide. I just didn't want to, like, anyone to see the uh, the nutritionist having a... Uh, yeah, I went to I was I was so tired, but like it was, like it, it was it was an unreal experience, like to be there, and then especially like now he's he's won that he's hopefully just finalising a few things. He's going to be debuting for the UFC in in London. Oh wow! Yeah, so that's why I'm going. I'm going back. For that. Oh, that's so the first long... thing I'm going to go back for. Yeah. So how long are you in town for? Uh, I'm in town for another two weeks. Oh wow! Yeah. Then you're flying straight back out. Back to, yeah. This is this is a life that you're living now. Yeah. yeah. Back, to, back to the UK on the fly on the literally just bought me flight yesterday. Fly on the eighth. Oh. Yeah. Wow. On the eighth of July. Yeah. And, and then, then USC London's on the twenty third. Okay. And then I've got. I'm trying to think what. Then there's another um, like a road to one championship tournament on oh. in the UK on the 9th of August, and then. I'm trying to think of like, and then Liam Harrison's fighting for his world title um Bond Championship in Singapore mm-hmm. on 26 August, and then probably be back to Perth in September. I think. Fuck. <laughs> yeah. Have you got anyone currently? Uh, uh, you had mentioned the kickboxer who's competing on this weekend. Yeah, Shannon Gardner. So she's fighting for the WBC world title, mm-hmm. um, against a girl called Neve Kinahan. She's she's from Manchester. So yeah, she. Uh, so I've got two. To competing this weekend, actually, her and a boyfriend. It's crazy. We've got a couple who were, who were, both, who were both competing on oh, the same card. That's uh, rare. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so um, that's on Saturday, which should be should be an interesting event. And um, yeah, back back on the travels again. Yeah, I just can't believe. I just like it's crazy how you went from yeah, just chilling in Perth, and now all of a sudden it's just like it's, it's exploded pretty much, and you now got this whole six months of all this travels and all this competing around and. All that. I mean, it must it must be a bit of a culture shock for you and all that, you know. Well, I think as well what we spoke about before. It's like I, I a lot of people. This this is going into like sort of self development, motivation and stuff. It's like yeah, you know what would be. I looked at like what's the downside of me going? Like there's only positives going. Like you know, making the developing the friendships and the the connections with the gyms over there. It's like to me, it's like an absolute like no brain and people like. People who haven't got, who've got normal jobs and stuff like, well, why, why do you want to leave Perth? Perth's, Perth's amazing. Don't you want to like settle here? It's like, well, right now it's like you need. This is the this is the growth part of the business. Where if it don't go, I'd I'd regret it. Yeah, because once you start, because when you turn up on opportunities, that's when people start asking themselves, what if? Yeah, and that's, and that's what I, I don't want. That's one thing I don't. I don't want to be like, you know what? Yeah, if, if it's just gone there, it's just gone there. It's like. At the moment, like for me, I am I'm not I haven't got my own house here. I'm just I'm with, staying with friends and stuff like that. So it's like it's literally like the the perfect opportunity for me to just go. You know what? Obviously, the flights are fucking expensive. At the moment, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, it's not cheap. <laughs> um, apart from that, you know, it's and especially when I'm talking about the seminars and stuff. Like it's it's a it's 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 literally just like a no brainer for me to go and like I can come back and say, you know what. I gave it a good go. I gave it a go. Some things might work. Some things might not work. But at least I've done it. Yeah. So what's like, um, in terms of business wise, what what are you like focusing on for the future? Like, do you have an idea in mind? Like, do you maybe hopefully establish your own office? Are you hoping to create a team? Do you know what? It's crazy because if you'd have said to me six months ago, you'd have like be, you'd have left Perth and gone traveling. I'd have been like. <laughs> I don't, don't think that. But now I'm like I'm at the point where like I'm just setting like three month goals. I'm just like seeing because things change all the time. Where like when I went home the first time, I was to watch a couple of events, but then other opportunities come up, like the seminars and going to see other people. It's like yeah, it, I think just continually just continue what I'm doing for the next few few months, and then 
when you, for example, doing the seminars, something will click in my mind for another idea, and then just, yeah, I'm just literally keep on proving my practice, keep growing as a person, and then, yeah, just take, That's good. take it from there, man. I see you posting a lot of stuff from Ryan Holiday. Yeah. Yeah, he's brilliant. Oh, I, that's like, that stoicism is like, just, it's, it's like, I look at it as like a template to follow any sort of decision you want to make, and it's always a reference point to go back to that. Like, for example, I said about, you know, leaving Perth where you've been here for, you know, ne- nearly five years to go and venture and go into the unknown. And when you listen to a bit of stoicism, it's like, it just calms you down and go, you know what? Like, I don't need to be anxious about it. It's like, I need to think it's a good decision and do it. Yeah, these I find myself reading and listening to him so much more often. Yeah. Um, we both got the same book, by the way, but it's the 365 Meditations, the Daily Stoic book. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's the perfect thing. So if anyone's li- listening right now and they want the probably the easiest book to read, all you have to do is literally just read half a page a day, Ryan Holiday's uh, Daily Stoic, because my favorite thing to do is to read that book. And all I do is read a page each day. I copy the quote and then... I try and write in half a page my own interpretation of yeah, it. Yeah. And that's like a habit that a lot of people could do. And not even that, but I've also started recommending it to guys who I know who are fighters. Yeah. Because, I mean, the, I, there's a quote they say about the ideal person is the warrior poet. Yeah. Something along those lines and all that. Because it's better to be, you know, I mean, if, fuck, I can't get, can't actually think of the same thing. But if you get your worries to think, then... It will, or your politicians to fight, then your politicians will be fools. I don't know. So, uh, is it a bit similar to the? Have you read the book Ego is the Enemy? Yes, correct. Yeah. So, like, I think that's a good book in terms of like, even for me, I think Joe, because even in just general life, when you when you do well and you get successful, you, you you tend to get like, oh, you think you, you, you know, sometimes you're, oh, I'm I'm doing all right at the moment, and like that kind of book just levels you out and go, you know what? There's so much more to go, and like. It's just a great way of just like changing your way of thinking at times. Mm-hmm. And I think that the thing with the, I don't know if his ego is enemy, but mentioned about like, um, there was a, an old UFC fighter and he says, you've got to train with someone who's the same level as you, who you're worse than and who you're better than. And that's the only way you can improve by, if you, if you, if you train with someone who's the same level, you've always got to be training with someone who's better than you to, to push you. Mm, fair point. I mean, I think I butchered that. By the way, <laughs> <laughs> that's all good. That's all good. That's all good. Anyway, so heading back on to the topic, there's one yeah. thing I wanted to ask you and talk about now because it's becoming. We can agree now that nowadays combat sports are becoming increasingly more and more popular. Oh yeah, they're they're pretty much, you know, nowadays it's something so small such as jiu-jitsu here in Perth. You have competitions almost every weekend here, and. The biggest thing it's in the talks about right now is CTE, which is a topic that I was hoping really to bring up with you because it's yeah. what a lot of people fear the most yeah. in um, what is it in what fear the most in combat sports. So starting with let's break down like what is it, and then I was hoping if you could like give us like some sort of like talks into like the research that's like sort of happened lately. So th- this is me trying to say it's clear. So it's called chronic traumatic. Encephalopathy. Okay. So it's basically it was diagnosed as punch drunk syndrome. Yeah, that's yeah. a thing. <laughs> when you said that, I'm like that's how you say it because it's such a that last word, so hard to yeah. say. And all it that. took me a while to. to uh, <laughs> like, I was thinking in my head and so, but uh, yeah, it was, it was it was originally called punch punch drunk syndrome um, in boxes. Um, to give a bit of background as well, something that I didn't really know that much about, and I, mm. I remember listening to a podcast. I can't remember who it was. And it was somebody who um, who lost their husband, who was a fighter, mm-hmm. and um, he got diagnosed. And he, I, I don't know if he ended up killing himself or something like that. Anyway, so I thought, oh, this is an area I really want to look into. Mm-hmm. And um, it was originally, the main research was on like NFL players. So basically, it's, it's just repeated collisions to the heads and the, you know, the ricochet backwards and forwards. And that, um, that basically... How to, how to explain it? Um, breaks down neurons in your brain and builds up this thing called tau, and it's like it, it basically kills cells in your brain. And they did it. They did a, um, a research study on NFL players, and it was massive. Like they, they found, like they got brains of like things like over hundred NFL players, and like something crazy, like 
80, 80 of them, 80 of the 100 had some form of CTE. And um, with CTE as well, it's it's a, it sort of builds up over years and guys who are relatively healthy, by the time they're 40, the they commit suicide, the anger issues, confusion, memory loss. Um, and yeah, it's the thing with the NFL study as well, because I think the team was in Boston that did the research. Like the NFL community was like, no, this is a load of nonsense, like because they're trying to advocate, you know, safer practice issues, you know, about helmets and stuff like that. And it sort of got pushed aside saying, oh, this is a load of bullshit. And then, I think people are starting to realise now because there's been quite a few high profile deaths in NFL mm. players who were just like normal normal blokes and then in the forties they just they ended up like killing themselves mm. or and and stuff like that. So in terms of combat sports, it's relatively it's relatively I wouldn't say new, but there's not that much research on it because it can only be sort of prescribed when you're deceased. Cause yeah. Because you, you, know, you have to take the brain apart. Um and it's it's a very, I think it's a very sensitive topic. Is like, what would be the safest way of doing things? Will it probably be wearing head guards or no, no, no head impacts. You know, when they're younger. But is that is that going to happen? I, I don't think it will. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a sensitive topic because probably the, the tech book science recommendation, like, you know, up to eighteen, you don't want you to get hit in the head. But you know. Part of the sport. It's part of the sport, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, I did a post the other day, and, like, well, I, did one, I think they did one the other week, and then a few months back, and, like, people messaged me saying, oh, well, like, what, what do you reckon I should do? It's like, no, this is not just, this is not me, like, yeah. advocating, just, like, just to give a bit of background, and, like, things can happen. Not not everyone is going to get that, mm-hmm. but it's just being aware, and also, as well, like, combat sports, it's not your whole life, you know, at one point you are gonna retire, so you gotta think about the future, what you what you what your health's gonna be like when you're older as well. Mm-hmm. I was like uh been reading about it a lot myself yeah. because it's something that it's not just combat sports quite prevalent, but sports in general. Yeah, like yeah, how like often like do you see a guy like, get knocked down yeah. from a head from yeah. playing football yeah. or rugby? It's nasty and all that but the one thing that i was wanted to ask you that was in relevance to combat sports yeah. was because we talk a lot about weight cuts and the dangers of the dehydration is it true is if you're more dehydrated from like a big weight cut let's say you had to drop five kilos and all that or something like that and then it's the day before the competition oh that is that person more vulnerable yeah 100 percent. Yeah. yeah and the way you look at it's like a, a, a rock and a cup analogy so You've got a rock and a glass of water, and it's full. Yeah. You shake the shake the cup around; it, it swirls around, not much impact. But then you've got a rock and a cup, and it's only got a little bit of water, and you shake it around; it's going to be clattering. So think about the brain as as that rock. So the more dehydrated you are, you're more prone to you know when you are getting hit to getting knocked out because the fluid is not in your you, you fluid depleted in your brain, and um, that's really an in, 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 interesting research. Um, is you know regardless of how much fluid you have post weighing is that fluid going to get back say you lost for example you lost five kilos doing a water score mm-hmm. and you had the recommendation and um, the fluid recommendations have in that post weighing period is is that fluid had enough time to get back into the brain because it's not just like you drink water and it goes oh back back into your body again it takes it there's gradients there's time to get it takes time to get back into the cells and stuff so, um, to answer your question, it's it definitely more prone to the people who do bigger weight cuts mm. to um, concussion, 100%. Yeah, because there's we've talk, we also talked about that in, in the pre- past, we talked about also things like creatine yep. and how that's shown to actually decre- uh, delay, no, sorry, decrease the effects of concussion yeah. and all that and CTE. But it's such a... Is it's a bit of a grey area because it's not something we would recommend to someone who's trying to weight cut because with creatine, creatine because it doesn't it binds to water. So the thing with creatine is a little bit of a a little bit of a myth. So you know people think oh creatine binds to water. Yeah. If you're if say for example you are two weeks out of a, from 
competing, you're doing a weight cut. Mm -hmm. Would I recommend taking creatine then? Probably not because there might be a little bit of a water increase. But if you're taking it just habitually throughout, you know, out of camp, just uh, throughout the year, I wouldn't recommend stop stop taking it because that there tends to be with some people, some not, um, a bit of a water increase, but that levels out after a while. Yeah. So the 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 research has shown that it could be up potentially up to one one kilo, one point two kilos, but then some people might not have any water and um, water retention. Um, so yeah, my rule of thumb is if you're taking it, you you're just taking it throughout the year, every day. And you go into a fight camp, would I recommend stop taking it? No, but if you're like, oh, I'm two weeks out, do you recommend start taking creatine? I'd be like, no, because then that might be, you may be that person who has that slight increase in water retention. That makes sense. Oh, okay, okay, and yeah, because the it's when we talk when I've I've listened to a couple of podcasts about it when they were talking about fighters whose careers they get cut short because they had like a massive weight cut, you know. Um, because they had a fight on short notice and there's reasons why they took the fight, you know. Yeah. They got to pay for the kids, they got to pay for the wife, they got to pay for the house. And all that. So they took the fight on short notice, hoping to get the payday, massive weight cut, get knocked out, obviously. And it's insane damage to the body because then the body is more vulnerable to getting hit because it's what would be normally a punch which they could take in sparring yeah. training turns into a punch that's going to be the one that's knocking them out. Yeah. And then over time, because the brain itself has a very... uh like the neuro pathway when it comes to pain. Yeah. So therefore it's like more likely to get knocked out from a punch that was barely overdo damage. Well, you've, you've probably seen it on, yeah. on in the UFC and stuff where you think, does that knock someone out like that punch? Like, yeah. um, and especially like, well, that's, that's a good thing about the, the UFC now with it, especially in the UFC is they've got the performance industry. So a lot less fighters are doing big, big weight cuts nowadays. Mm hmm. But it's still, but in that lower level amateur, you know, lower professional scene, you know, I still, I still see it now. When I've been to them events, I've seen the 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 look of some of the the guys weighing in. You can tell, f fucking hell, they've they've cut a lot of weight just by looking at them. And it's like, yeah, there needs to there needs to be more education. I think it's definitely growing now, and more people are, are seeking out people like myself, and there's more people, you know getting into this area as well so um people aren't sure to find and good information but still like a lot of years behind other sports in terms of like good nutrition practices yeah someone asked me as well when it comes to weight cutting um they would also wanted me to ask you but is weight cutting there is there a method to it to being gender specific um and that's a weird one to ask really. in terms of like the water cut yes because females tend to have less total body water because females tend to have more body fat so okay body fat is around 20 percent water compared to muscles around 80 percent water so in terms of the water cut you don't want to be cutting as much um fluid and also in terms of the the menstrual cycle as well um different phases um influence total body water so yeah uh, i always do like rule of thumb if, if a female's cutting any weight you don't want to be going any more than like three percent mm. of the body weight and um, it's a bit different for guys there's a bit more flexibility but you've got to be really dialed in um with the female weight cut because yeah um so it's funny because like male physiology you could probably write you know a book on it with female physiology there's probably about 10 books and you're not even covering yeah <laughs> not even covering the the the, the um the start of it yeah it's just the, it's the problem you've probably heard this a lot but it's just that Gene, it's the te the talent pool for females in combat sports is just nowhere near as yeah. big as it should uh, as it is for guys, <coughs> yeah. which is fair enough. Over time, we'll see it growing. Yeah, but I feel like like nowadays the research is needs to become more and more gender specific. Yeah, hundred percent. Because we talk because nowadays, I mean, we're going to more of the political side of things, but we don't have to get too deep into it. It's like tra is like transgendered athletes. Yeah. And for anyone who comes on, tries to cancel me on the podcast, just wait. <laughs> but we've got to understand because you are a nutrition yourself and yeah. it, your body is gender specific. Yeah. And when it comes to like athletes and t things like testosterone and 
changing and hormone balances and transitioning, I'm all for I'm all for you actually competing. I want you to compete because that's your that's what you want to do and that's your dream and all yeah. that. But it's just the it's the organizations that people have to watch out for. Like um do you remember this when we had that Olympic weightlifter, I forgot her name from New Zealand, the one who transitioned to a man and then he got or she she got to compete at the Olympics and she after she had broken the New Zealand record and then there was that American sprinter that wasn't allowed to go to the Olympics because she tested positive for smoking weed. Yeah, I think I've seen that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I always tell people it's not to do with the like the person. Yeah. Go after the organization. You yeah, know yeah. what I mean. Yeah. Go after the rule set because they found a loophole, and that's yeah. and one it was a case <coughs> of one had broken the rules and one had found a loop in the rules. So they shouldn't. They should be definitely excluded from each other. Um, but yeah, like. From someone such as yourself, who's been around with all these combat sports athletes, why, what would you say would be a good solution for, I'm just saying spitballing really, why, what would you say would be a good solution for this? I think, it's like, very, huh? very, I think it's very difficult for that, like, because there's not going to be a, a plethora of, of transgender fighters around isn't yeah. it like I'll, I'll, I'll probably like a thousand people or fighters there may be like one or two so it's like quite hard to have a distinctive category but uh, yeah it's yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky one have you ever actually worked with someone like that before no Never, yeah. yeah fair enough yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. every yeah yeah it, it, it's as you said it, like if they want to compete fair play to them that, that, that's all like I'm all for it but I can see the thing where, you know, someone who's, I think there was another one with the swimmer and she was yeah. like ranked like 250th or something in the men's and then as soon as she went to the women, she was like... She smashed it. She <laughs> smashed it. So there's got to be a point where like, come on, like it's a bit... It's, it's hard. It's hard to like... Because there's, there's not a big pool of... Well, I, I, I don't know personally, but I can't imagine to be a massive pool of transgender swimmers where they can have their own category against the against other transgender mm -hmm. athletes so yeah it's just it's a it's a strange one it's weird yeah fair enough fair enough. yeah just like but like, a, but like the way things the way things are there probably will be like a transgender fighter yeah. like you know I, I wouldn't be surprised if that if that didn't didn't happen yeah which oh. would be quite interesting to see how that how that plays out. Yeah. Well, I mean, there might be definitely changes in the future and all that, but like I've, how I see it is when the, and I had an argument with someone the other day, why don't we just eliminate gender from sports? And I'm like, fuck no, that was the biggest, yeah. <laughs> I cannot ever see that happening. I don't, I'm sorry, but if I were to watch a rugby game and it was men and team of men and women, yeah. and then the men charges into the woman at a full force, no thanks. Same like the UFC, like what's the like? Imagine like the the champion of the one of the women's weight classes against the similar weight category to them. They'd be that'd just be mad. That'd be the craziest things. <laughs> <laughs> that would be one of the craziest things. Anyway, because we're heading up straight to the uh, heading up to the end now. So, um, you also recently well, so the last thing I also wanted to ask you personally was about uh. What is what was it when it came to supplementation? Another thing that a lot of fighters take in these days is they talk a lot about magnesium yeah. and zinc as one thing that's helping them to sleep, right? Yeah. But there was also they talked about the type of that there was arguments for that if you're just taking magnesium on your own when you, it's not something you actually need, it's almost completely useless. Yeah. Is that something that's true as well? It's same with same with a lot of the sleep we share. It's a bit. It's a bit hit and miss, really. Right. And a lot of the time, I found with using when athletes have asked to take magnesium, it's been a bit more of a, a placebo kind of effect. Where, okay. um, yeah, it's a it's it's a tricky area that the, the sleep research because, for example, with the with the melatonin that can cause like drowsiness and you know make you feel a bit groggy the next day. So you could take you could take melatonin, for example. And you wanted to sleep for you want to have a good sleep before you fight. You could wake up the next day feeling pretty shitty and that could 
ultimately affect your performance. So it's a bit, yeah, it's, a, I try, my rule of thumb is I try and use nutrition, not supplements, mm-hmm. to, 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 to combat any sort of sleep issues. Mm-hmm. Um, and then if we can't, if that's not working, then we look into the supplement side of things. That oh, makes cool. sense. Yeah. Oh, cool. And the last one yep. I just had written down, man, was uh, obviously too, too much depth. But you know when you go on TikTok, you see all these things like, oh, five foods to do this or five foods to do that. Obviously, when it comes to losing weight, I mean, there's no such thing as five foods that can help you lose yeah. weight and all that. But there was one that I definitely came across was, and especially beneficial for males, was in terms of testosterone. Yeah. So from research that you've done, is there any like types of foods that, actually helping boost testosterone or is that all no, just pseudoscience? Not, not really. Um, there's nothing sort of specific. Um, and in terms of any supplementation to increase testosterone, unless you're taking it like actual... The juice. Test- <laughs> <laughs> unless you're taking juice. There's no there's no supplements with like then test boosters don't, don't increase testosterone levels. Yeah. Like, it's just a complete waste of time. So... Oh. Um, yeah, um, I think just eating a balanced diet, plenty of protein, um, you're training well, your testosterone levels are going to be naturally, um, naturally high. So save save any money, don't get any test boosters from the supplements, though. Oh, cool. <laughs> All righty. So we're just coming up to the end. Thanks again, P. Thank you, Appreciate mate. it, man. Uh, and I always ask this, but if anyone wants to find you or work with you, man, where can they find you, buddy? Just hit me up on Instagram, Condition Nutrition. That's where I'm most active. So, yeah. Do you want to drop a question and ask me anything? I'm uh, I'm pretty um, responsive, so yeah. Awesome. All right. Thank you very much for listening, guys. Pete, thank you very much, thank guys. You. And thank you for listening to the Last Set Podcast. That is a game.